hear now together the, the word of the Lord for us this evening, which says, Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. It's the word of the Lord for us. Let's pray. Father, would you teach us the meaning of uh, the text, this illustration used by Jesus, that we might be those who don't give out um, pearls where we shouldn't be giving them. Uh, give us wisdom and instruction from your word this evening, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The, the main idea, the overarching idea of what I want you to gain from tonight and to have this in mind is that we, we need, and we see so many verses, that we need boldness to open our mouths. We need to pray and seek boldness that we would proclaim what Jesus has done to others, but we also need wisdom of when to close our mouth, when to be quiet. And so this verse op offers us that opportunity tonight that we don't want to move away from our, our need for boldness to open our mouth, but wisdom when to close it. So as I said, at first glance, it seems as though this verse is kind of randomly in here, or, or maybe it doesn't seem to have much of a connection. And this later part of Matthew 7 does seem to offer some almost like proverb-like insights from Jesus. Um, but I would argue for a continuation from what he has said. Uh, it is not just randomly thrown in there or somebody remembered something else that Jesus has said and, and, and whacked it in there into this part of the scripture. But if we think about where we came from, previous verse, um, removing the speck. So we're not to judge in a, um, in, a, in a wrong sense, we're to judge righteously and we will play a part in helping somebody else to remove the speck, but we're going to deal with the log in our own eye first. So we spoke about that need. We saw that last week, that there's a need for judging righteously, being discerning. And so this discernment that comes up is something that is evident here. We need discernment about not giving pearls to pigs, um, as, as the verse says. Uh, a righteous judgment and discernment is very necessary for Christian living. Uh, and so we need discernment in when to stop talking, when to labor no longer in offering out the wisdom of God and the precious things of God to others. Um, and so there is certainly a, a connection, I believe, to be made in, in the way that the passage flows through. So after removing the log, you can see clearly you are able to show concern for another about their speck. But Jesus goes on to say, do not give dogs what is holy. The first thing we have to have in mind here is uh, when Jesus talks about dogs, who is he referring to? He's not talking to, speaking about actual dogs, which we would, I'm sure, get. We're going to need to suspend our, our cultural understanding of dogs and take on the mindset of an Israelite. For an Israelite, a Jewish person, the dog was actually a despised scavenger, running around on the outside of the city looking for scraps. Um, dogs were not like they are here for us as domestic pets with their own um, cafes and specialized diets and so forth. They were despised creatures. And so he is referring to people then, when he says this term, uh, this, this word dogs, as people who ultimately make it their business to hate the things of God. They despise the kingdom of God. They are enemies of Christ and they act like they are enemies of Christ. Um, this isn't the first time, however, that uh, dogs have been referred to in Scripture, referring to people. Um, Psalm 22, verse 16 is, is worth a look if you want to turn there in your Bible. This is the famous Messianic Psalm. All of Scripture points to Jesus, but there are places in Scripture that are more explicitly uh, the, the details of Christ and in particular his crucifixion is shown. Psalm 22, 16 says, For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Now this whole psalm, this chapter, has multiple cross-references to the Gospels where we see the events of Jesus, like the casting of lots for his clothing. Uh, and so here we have, back in the, in the psalm, we have these details of Golgotha. But here, as we picture um, what this is about, this is about Jesus having the mob around him, having a group of angry people yelling, crucify him. They encircle him. They, they are around him. Um, 
demanding that he be put to death. And so in the text here, we have this imagery or illustration of dogs encompassing me, which is the evildoers surrounding Christ uh, at the time of, of Calvary. And uh, another place where we'll see, you'd have to turn to this one, but Philippians chapter 3, verse 2 says, beware of the dogs. So again, not actual dogs, um, but people. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the false teachers and the evildoers. Um, Paul is giving this warning to the church in Philippi. And then in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, um, drawing from the proverb, says what the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog, will, dog returns to its own vomit and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. So again, we actually have both dog and pig uh, sow referred to here in the, same, in the same text again of these, uh, these evildoers. And this teaching of the dog returning to its own vomit um, is is helpful in understanding that a sinner returns to their sin, um, like a dog returns to eating its own vomit. It's a gross depiction, but that's actually what it is like when you go back to your sin. It's as, it's as foul as a dog going and eating its own vomit. And so, so here we see that this dog and pig references um, don't just turn up here with Jesus' words, but are found in um, other places in Scripture. And so metaphorically, to call someone a dog means that this is a person of an impure mind. It's an evildoer. It is an impudent person. It's somebody who shows no respect. And so Jesus is saying, don't give to him who is unclean, him who is disrespectful, impure in mind, don't give to them the precious things of God. Don't give them pearls. So he gives a second illustration where we get to the pigs here. He says, do not throw your pearls before pigs. And uh, I think this is a great illustration once again, like last week I talked about how great the illustration was of Jesus talking about the speck versus the log. You just see it so clearly when you, when you read it, you just picture that. And, and it's, it's very helpful just to have that illustration in your mind. And again, we have this picture of this pig being thrown, precious pearls. Um, pigs don't care about the worth of pearls. They are not impressed by your pearls. If you thought unwisely to go up to a pig with some pearls, you thought, I will share these pearls that I've got with this pig. What will the pig do? Will it receive them? It will not. It will trample them underfoot. It does not care. They are not precious to the pig. Won't even give them another look. Um, they will fall to the ground to be trampled under the foot. So Jesus says, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So not only is the concern that they trample them, but the swine turns to you and attacks you. It goes for you. Now, maybe you weren't thinking like that because maybe when you saw this phrase, pearls before pigs, maybe you had, you know, little pink pig ho hobby farm in mind. I'm thinking wild pig. I'm thinking razor sharp uh, uh, tusk. I'm thinking um, wild boar. I did, however, look up domestic pig and whether or not they could be dangerous, just out of interest. So if you want to take the illustration further and consider the, the cute little pig in the hobby farm pig pen, this is what Google gave me. Now, I'm no expert on pigs, but I'm just going to tell you what Google gave me. Google gave me this. It said, domestic pigs are usually placid, but they can become aggressive if disturbed and attack humans, producing severe injuries due to trampling, kicking, and biting. So there you go. Even your uh, uh, more friendly looking pig can actually turn on you. Now, what's the point here? To Jesus teaching us to watch out for pigs? No, he is talking about what we have of God that is precious and who we share this with. You have here pearls. Don't give dogs what is holy. Don't give pearls to pigs. That which is precious, that which is holy and sacred should not go to certain people. Uh, two things that we're going to need to do here with this text is ask, what exactly is holy? What are these pearls that we are to withhold? That's the first question. And the second one is, how do we identify the ones who we are instructed to not give those pearls to? So let's do the first one. What is holy? What are the pearls that we are to withhold, not give uh, to pigs or dogs? Um, because the illustration stands alone, that it isn't connected ultimately with 
uh, much other verses to, to help us to unpack this, there is room for this being quite broad in the, in the first part in terms of that it pertains to all the things of God. The precious teachings of our Bible, the things of God, it is the gospel, it is about the kingdom of God. So our pearls are ultimately the teachings of God. And so when we think about Jesus going from place to place throughout his ministry, his earthly ministry, he is taking these pearls, he's taking these precious uh, uh, teachings of the kingdom of God. And in some places it's rejected and with others it's received. So Jesus himself is in, a, is in ministry, place to place, where this very thing is being, this very practice is being lived out. And Jesus moves on quickly. When people are not interested, he is on the move. I remember this being fascinating to me a number of years ago, studying uh, Mark's gospel. Now, Mark's gospel is great in the sense of it being very, just very action. It is just one story after another. It's just, it's on the move. And it's a, it's a shorter gospel, so it's easy to go through. But one thing that fascinated with me about Jesus was the reality that he wasn't hanging around. He wasn't, if you weren't interested, he was on the move to the next place and looking for people who, who were the disciples. Um, he continued on in this sense. Now, he had places to cover and, and that, of course, but he wasn't chasing people. He wasn't going out and somebody's rejected him and, oh, well, I'll stay here for three or four more weeks and see if I can work on this person a little bit more. You're either coming or you're not. And very much our proclamation is this very thing. Jesus Christ is Lord, and we call people to know him and receive the good news. And you are either coming or you're not. I can't force you to do this. And this is demonstrated in the ministry of Jesus himself. And so what are these pearls? They are the things of God, the precious teachings of the kingdom of God, the, the good news of the gospel and all that pertains to the one true God, mighty Yahweh. Uh, number two, so how do we identify the ones we are instructed not to give the pearls to? Um, let me start with a very general illustration to just get our minds in the, in, the, in the right thinking here. I was a youth worker for many years. And in a similar sense, what I'm talking about with, with Jesus and his teaching and some taking, there were young people who wanted help and they wanted to be taught. And there were ones who mocked what we were doing. Not many, but there were ones who didn't, uh, didn't want anything. They didn't want a bar of us whatsoever. I remember one family who lived close by to us. Um, there were teens in and out of this, this house. It was a, a single mother home, and there was teenage boys regularly around there. So I would see them at work, but then I would also see them when I went home. There was two brothers who lived there. One was mostly interested in being a little gangster. Um, when he got paid from Centrelink, he bought... Fresh trainers, brand new uh, $200 sneakers. He had no money and then he went around the neighborhood acting like a tough guy. Um, and he would turn up for help a few days later when he didn't have any money. But that's really the only reason he came was for, you know, getting some sort of financial assistance or whatever he could, he could take. Um, the other brother showed a little more concern. He showed something different and he tried to help out. I could see him in this and... I remember one particular week, the lawn was overgrown and uh, I took her over my edge trimmer and my mower and I taught this young man how to mow the lawn and how to use the edge trimmer. And he was grateful to receive the help and, and put it into practice. Now, on the day we were doing this, there was three other guys who were there um, on their scooters and um, they were just hanging around while he was learning to, to use this equipment and all they had was jokes and mocking him as he was doing this. Now, I tried. I reached out to these guys to say, well, if you guys got involved, we'd, we'd have this done in no time. But they, had, they only had jokes and mocking um, to go with it. They were not interested in helping a single mother. They were not interested in anything. They just wanted to take from the place and use it as, for their own purposes. Now, in the Old Testament, uh, the actual description for such young men would be worthless fellows. That's the, that's the language I've been noticing in the Bible. When we talk about like Eli's sons and, and uh, these... These young men, they're worthless fellows. They do nothing. They offer nothing. Worthless. Um, now, I made some, as I said, I made some reference for them to get involved. They were not interested. That's sad. But unless by the grace of God or by way of some massive event changing, they weren't going to grow up to become men who could provide for a wife and a family. 
They, they had no skills to be able to look after a property and care for uh, uh, belongings to, to provide for a family. Um, they just mocked all of this. Now, I could have left the guy who was interested and pursued the other three and said, oh, well, he gets it. I'll just leave him. I'll go to these ones. And they're, they're clearly not interested. But maybe if I have the right speech, maybe if I have the right presentation or there's something that I can say that will get them there. I tried. They weren't interested. Let's leave it at that. Come back another day. Uh, maybe in a year or later, a year or two later, um, they will uh, regret that or they will seek out some help. But at this point, they are rejecting the offer. And so I pursue them no further. No need to give pearls to pigs or worthless fellows, so to speak. Now, I'm comparing here edge trimmer and mower with precious pearls of God to be able to say how much more precious are the eternal things of the living God and his kingdom. The true pearls we desire to bring to others who will be able to receive them. And so what I want to do is to, to be able to get a sense of well, where do we stop talking? Where do we go but know where to hold back these pearls from? I just want to show you a couple of places in Scripture tonight to uh, be advised, not by my own thoughts, but be advised by Scripture itself. Let's go to Matthew chapter 10. First thing I want to say about this text is it's got a very Jewish context. God is doing a big thing in terms of bringing the gospel to the Jews first and then the Gentiles. This is a fulfillment of this prophecy. Um, and so this is very Jewish focused. But we're going to take a principle from this and apply it to evangelism and apply it to our sense of going out into the world. Verse 5 of Matthew 10 says, These twelve Jesus sent out. Instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans. So he's saying that because it's not, it's not for them yet. It's a Jewish focus at this point. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. There's, there's many to be true believers. There's people to, to, to be called and to come in. And go to, uh, and proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. Raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without paying, give without pay. So the disciples are given this, this power of God to be able to go and perform signs and, and wonders for declaring that Jesus is the true Messiah. Uh, in verse 9, it says, Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics, or sandals, or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it, and stay there until you depart. Find out who is worthy. How do we find out? Well, let's keep reading. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. So make peace with the people of this place. Uh, this will be the place where you camp out, where you, where you stay and engage and talk and share precious pearls, right? Uh, the, if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. Verse 14, and if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. So there's a great judgment that is coming um, to, uh, to, to Jerusalem, to, um, to Israel for their rejection. That's the context that this is all in. But have a look at what Jesus did. He didn't say stay around and argue yourself till you're blue in the face. He doesn't say, um, you know, enter as many theological debates with the people as possible. Now there's a place for theological debate. We, we need to have that. But in terms of the going out of the gospel, the preaching of the good news, find the ones who welcome you and will receive the message. Verse 13, if the house is worthy, I want to show you the wording of this in Luke's gospel. Turn over to Luke chapter 10. So we've got Matthew 10. We're going to Luke 10.
And I think Luke's gospel gives us something quite great to take a hold of here. Matthew's chapter gave us this understanding of uh, the house, thinking of it as I've, I've come into the house and if there's, there's peace here, this is going to get a bit more direct about where this peace is coming from to the, to the person. Verses 5 and 6, whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. Verse 6, and if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. So the house is worthy, whether it's determined by whether the people are worthy, whether or not they are a son of peace or a person of peace. So again, in the context, this is the the true believer, the true Israel, the one who will um, believe upon the Messiah and, and, and follow. As they came to the house with the good news, if they were welcomed by the person and showed peace towards them, that the house and the people in the house, they weren't hostile towards them, but they were peaceful towards them, then direct your attention there. They would stay there and teach more. They would eat with them. They would have fellowship with them until the time to depart. But if they received rejection and hostility, like a pig tries to trample and attack you, like a dog that is a scavenger and is not interested in these precious things, uh, keep on moving. Shake the dust off your feet. Don't throw your pearls before these ones. Now, this doesn't mean that there wouldn't be debate along the way. Of course there would be. We are told to defend the Christian faith. We zoom out and we think of the other verses where we're called to defend the faith. We recognize that that is part of our bold proclamation to Um, bring every thought captive and to destroy arguments that are raised up against Christ. But Christ sends out his people into the world to tell the good news for those who have the ears to receive it. And the biggest emphasis that we have, our main attention and our drive goes towards those who have a welcoming uh, uh, peace about them to receive this good news. That's where we're that's where we're aiming. Um, So let me apply this in sense of, uh, let me think of, okay, we today have been given the Great Commission. We are to go and make disciples. We are to go with the good news. So picture walking along and doing uh, evangelism in a public place. Some of you have gone out and done that before. Or you might think of yourself walking through your workplace and the relationships and connections that you've got with other people in your workplace. Now, you walk up to people, let's say, let's use the street evangelism approach, and somebody says, get lost. All right. Don't stay around for an argument. You, you might attempt a little bit further, but there's no sense in going on and using your entire afternoon with the people who have just told you to get lost. Uh, you will find, and anybody who's ever done street evangelism, finds that there are welcoming and receiving people who are warm towards you and want to know what you've got to offer. It always happens. We've never been out to do evangelism and not had fruitful, wonderful conversations about God. And so I want to apply this person of peace approach to help you in engaging with the world and family and friends and people out there that we go out ultimately looking for a person of peace in the same way that we would instruct them in the ways of God. Uh, That we would not labor on for too long with those who continually reject and mock and who despise everything that you have got. So I think Matthew 10, Luke 10 offers us some great insight here, even to the ministry of the disciples themselves. We understand that the spirit moves where the spirit moves as the wind blows. Now, I want to take you to another place from Scripture as well, which is Acts 17. Acts 17. We'll go to the ministry of Paul. Acts 17, we'll start from verse 1. We'll have a couple, look at a couple of sections here out of Acts 17. Okay, Acts 17, verse 1 says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. Man, I love that phrase. I love that phrase so much. I get this picture 
of Paul, the scriptures, the, the scrolls, and people are gathered around together like, like we might be with the Bible open and we're reasoning from the scriptures. There's, there's robust conversation. There'll be some debate in there. Oh, I love that phrase, reason with them from the scriptures. What does he reason with them about? It's here in verse 3. He's explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. So get that context. He's reasoning with people who haven't believed that Jesus was the promised Messiah. He's reasoning with Jewish people who are still waiting for the Messiah to come. And he's saying, no, he's already come. It's Jesus Christ. So he's, he's showing them that. And I imagine him opening up Psalm 22, like we just looked at earlier, right? I imagine him opening up Isaiah uh, 53 and, and going through these particular verses to proclaim and show that Jesus is the Christ, the, the Messiah that was promised. Now, let's see the result of what happens when he has been reasoning with them from the Scriptures. Verse 4 says, Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. Some of them were persuaded. So, uh, sorry, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. So there was actually quite a significant number of people who came in after this reasoning and explaining and proving from the scriptures. There were Jewish people who then called upon Christ for, sal for salvation. There were devout Greeks and women who came in and they joined Paul and Silas. So they came into the church is ultimately what, this what, what takes place. But what about ones that reject this? Well, verse 5 here. But the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of the rabble. They formed a mob, set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason. We just talked about pigs attacking you for what you have brought, right? There's an uproar seeking to bring them out to the crowd. They want them dead for what they have done. So... Paul goes in with this general casting of casting out of the of the good news of the Messiah. He's proclaiming this to all, but there's a specific group that are receiving this message and they become part of the church. The attention goes there. And so Paul will move on from this place. He will no longer proclaim this because people are attacking him over it and he will no longer give these pearls to these pigs. Same chapter, let's see another example, Acts 17, verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. This is a different context now because previously he's ministering to Jews, but now this is in a place in Athens where many gods. So he's coming in and he's seeing the idols that the people worship. Verse 17, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. So look at that general application of his evangelism and his proclamation. He's doing it everywhere. He's doing it in the synagogue. He's doing it out in the marketplace. That's the equivalent of uh, uh, us going out into places where people come together and um, have, have discussions. Uh, this, is a, this is what took play, place in marketplaces discussions of philosophy and, and, and all of this. It's us going out and doing our street witnessing and evangelism. He did this every day with those who happened to be there. Now, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. So there's a difference there, right? Some are straight up calling him a babbler. This guy is crazy and we don't want anything to do with what he has got. We do not want these pearls that he is offering because they look stupid to us. We do not want them. They are meaningless to us. Yet there was another group of people who said, come and teach us more about that. Are you seeing the same connection with this idea of a person of peace? They want more of this. And there's an application to make here that there are going to be times when you talk about Jesus and someone thinks of you like they thought of Paul as a babbler. They're going to call you a Bible basher and a fool and an ignorant person and a, uh, all sorts of names, right? 
If you're going to be a biblical Christian, that's just going to happen. You just take it on the chin. It's all right. You've been called names before, I'm sure, and you're still here. You're still okay. You're loved by God and your friends and family. And you know that Jesus suffered and, and uh, he wasn't just called names, that he was crucified for, uh, for, for what he has taught. Likewise, we are going to be okay, but there will be times where there are going to be people against us. And it's in these moments that we have to recognize, well, I think I've labored long enough here. Any more is going to be like throwing pearls before pigs. There's going to be people that you meet and you talk to Jesus, talk about Jesus to them, and they are going to receive what you've got to say with a warm welcome. They want to hear more of it. And there's going to be others who turn their nose up, scoff at you, and walk away. This is what Paul experienced, what the disciples have experienced. Um, I want to bring in, before I just make a few application points, I want to bring in something final to consider here. Today, there's a lot of talk of apologetics. It's a branch of theology uh, where we give a defense for the faith. And uh, so uh, based on where we read in Peter about um, uh, consider Christ, the Lord is holy, and give a response, give a defense of the faith that we have within us, we are called to do this. There's times where we will... Make a defense of the faith. This is, what, this is where the word apologetics uh, comes from. And uh, we've done this in, in bits and pieces over the last couple of years. But there are different types of apologetics that people engage with. And uh, there is two that I'm much more familiar with. One that I don't consider to be a strong witness when it comes to speaking with people. And that's evidential apologetics. And the one that I argue for, which I believe to be much more stronger in Scripture, is what's known as presuppositional apologetics. Now, there's much more teaching for that for another day, but I want to speak about evidential apologetics for a moment because this is one of the most common forms of the defense of the faith that you see. If you're familiar with William Lane Craig, um, uh, just general guys who would get up and defend Jesus in public settings. And often what they do is... The, the person who's against Christianity has got a million questions and the apologist, the Christian, runs around to collect evidence to try and prove to the person that Jesus is real, that the Bible's true. And so what they do is they take on the role of a defendant. If we bring this to a courtroom situation, you've actually elevated the, the sinner, or in this case, the person who's acting as the dog or the pig who rejects and is mocking what, what you have to offer. And you've elevated them to the position of judge over God. And your evidence is going to be whether or not your evidence was good enough for the, the, for the judge, the, the sinner, the non-believer, to determine whether or not they'll accept your God. Uh, I just don't believe that this is the right approach to honouring God, that we will elevate a sinner to the position of judge over him and that we would play the role as defendant of running around and gathering evidence. And so my instruction or, or advice around this is that when somebody says to you, prove that your God exists, or somebody comes to you and they've got a million questions, you have to come back to Romans 1 and recognize that the person already has the evidence that they need. It's because of they, their sin that they reject God. So you can pile up evidence as high as the, as tall as the building and, and then some, and they still will not turn and believe in Jesus Christ because all they're looking for is another excuse and another excuse. And the minute that you can show, I've got a bit of evidence here, they've got a different question. They've got a different objection to this. And so my advice to you is to look to stronger apologetics, but at the heart of this, the main thing we need to bring to an unbeliever is the gospel of Jesus Christ to call them to repentance of their sin and put their trust in Jesus Christ. And so um, we will we'll unpack that more throughout the year. We'll, we will talk more about apologetics, but I want you to be bold in the gospel of Jesus Christ and who he is, what he has done and present the gospel as opposed to thinking that you've got to run around and answer every single person's objection that comes along because ultimately what people are doing is they are suppressing the truth that they already have been given to them. Nobody has an excuse. All know God because God has given this to us through all that has been created as, as it teaches us in Romans 1. So back to our, our application here of how do we not then throw out our pearls before pigs? 
We need the boldness. So we've seen all through these texts, the disciples and Paul, they go with the boldness to open their mouth and proclaim, but they need the wisdom. We need wisdom when to close it. And so my first point tonight is this, is always tell the good news. Um, This should not bring some sort of consideration where we go, oh, I don't think that that person is going to be receiving of the good news, so I will withhold it. That's not what the text gives you a license for. All right? it's, not a, it's not a license for withholding the gospel because we think that's never up to us. And in many cases, the person that you think is going to be resistant to the gospel will be the one who receives it. Um, the person who looks the, the toughest and the meanest uh, will be the one that ends up standing with you and, and weeping over their sins. So we're not called to work that kind of thing out. We have a general proclaiming of the good news to all people. And so continue to do that. Be bold in that. Be like Paul who says, pray for me that I would be bold in the gospel. And he says, pray that doors would be opened. And this is the same for us. We pray for boldness to go and do. Um, Point two is this. We should, like what happens in the Bible, cast our seeds out generally, laboring then in the good soil after that. So we go out to proclaim the good news to all, but then we direct our energy and our attention to where the soil is good, where we are seeing a response that is peaceful and welcoming, where you see hostility and rejection. That's not the place you run to labor and direct all of your energy into. That would be you bringing your pearls before pigs. That would be you bringing the precious things things of God to somebody who's clearly rejecting, mocking, and not responding whatsoever. So cast generally to them. Call people to repentance of their sins, absolutely, but labor where the soil is good. Labor where there is peace and a response. Devote your, devote your energy and your time to where it will be fruitful. Um, look for the person of peace. And this is the same in the sense of making disciples of one another in the church. Um, I remember this phrase that was given to me many years ago. It said, put your energy and time into the faithful ones. Because particularly for for pastors, pastors receive messages and invites from people from all over the place. And they're not necessarily people who want to grow in the Lord. They're just looking for somebody to kind of be there for them at a particular time. And so you could actually neglect the faithful flock and spend all of your time on the outskirts, laboring and giving all of your energy and time, so redirect the attention towards those who are showing faithfulness in Christ. Put your energy there into the ones who are showing that. Um, Number three, make sure you know what the pearls are. That's, that's That's so crucial. It's one thing for us to sit here and talk about pearls and and, and think that, yeah, there's a place for sharing those. Make sure you know what it is that you're sharing. Make sure you're a Christian who, if you were asked, to ask, what is the gospel? You could articulate a concise answer about the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is so important. That's what the disciples could do. Um, I, I, I just want to reinforce this so much, that there, there is so much Christianity today where Christians, are, I do believe, are gen, uh, genuinely saved, but they can't talk about Jesus and what he did. If you said to them, hey, could you tell me what the good news is of Jesus? They might be able to say things like, well, it's 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 giving us hope. No, I mean, it does give you hope. That's not what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. Know what the pearls are like. Every single Christian should be able to articulate the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, I hope you're already thinking of a passage where you could go to um, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. I always direct people to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. Um, Romans 3, the, the, the entire chapter of Romans 3 to get a good, deep understanding of, of the gospel and justification being at the heart of it. That uh, uh, these, are, these are essential places. And the gospel is the good news, right? That's what the word gospel is, is good news that Jesus died for sinners and that he was resurrected from the grave. The response that we call from people is to hear that Jesus has died for their sins and was raised up and then to respond to that with repentance and faith. 
to turn away from their sins and trust in Jesus. Every Christian should have the ability and the wording of the gospel that they can sit in a meeting having coffee, they can be on the phone with a friend, they can be bumping into somebody in the shops, and they can weave the words of the gospel into a conversation and be able to say, hey, can I just tell you something? Can I just share something that just changed my life? Did you know that Jesus gave his life for us? Do you know that Jesus died for our sins so that we could have a new life in him? Gospel words, every Christian, if we had every Christian on the planet equipped with the ability to articulate the gospel, we're going to start seeing churches overflow because Christians go out not just to live in the world and try and stay safe and not sin too much and and just look for the next Christian bubble to belong to, but they go out boldly and dwell with the spirit of God and they start saying the gospel to other people. Know what the pearls are. And if you don't know what they are, get into the scriptures and study. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15, read those over and practice bringing that into your conversations. Um, There's a saying, and I hate it so much. It's a saying that says, preach the gospel and use words if necessary. Have you ever heard that one? Oh, it's so whack. (laughs) It is so terrible. The gospel is words. What do you mean preach the gospel and use words if necessary? The gospel is the words that you need to to preach and proclaim. You can't um, give someone a meal and get them into the kingdom of heaven. Um, Giving the meal is not the power of God for salvation. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. I'm not saying don't give the meal. Goodness me, give them the meal and then preach the gospel to them. This is what Christians need to have. They go out to do their kind deeds because we've got these versions of Christianity like the Salvation Army today that all they are is a, is a food kitchen where you can go and get a meal and you never get any of the gospel. The whole thing is, is done. The, the Salvation Army and, and all these other places like this have got no gospel in them whatsoever. Don't expect anybody to be redeemed from hell in such an environment. So Christian, hear me Tonight, labor over this point. Know the pearls. Know what the gospel is. Make it your first priority. Paul says, I preach this to you as of first importance. And Christians have got it on the back burner. Like, oh, maybe I'll bring it in if they ask me about it one day. Have you ever seen that meme where it's got the, the skeleton sitting at the office desk and it says, still waiting for somebody to ask me about the gospel? You'll be dead before somebody comes up to you and says, can you please tell me what the gospel is? You need to tell them so that they might have life and be saved. And so if you hear nothing else tonight here, please understand how important it is to know what the gospel is and be able to give life to somebody else. And that's what it is. It's the most precious thing on the planet. You think about giving somebody the nicest gift that you could give them. You're going to give them anything better than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who gave it to you? For me, it was, a, it was an RE teacher who walked into my classroom when I was in grade six and he, and he told me about sin and the need for repentance. It was the greatest gift ever received. Point four. Pray for boldness to speak and wisdom to stop talking. Ask for that wisdom. And you might, have a, you might have a family member that you just, you, you just, you're heartbroken about the fact that they're not coming to Christ. But at some point, you've got to stop trying to bang on about this with them. You, you've, got to, you've got to really take the reality that you've got to stop giving pearls to pigs here. Have you told your family member the good news yet? If you haven't done that, well, back to point three. Make sure you know the pearls and tell them the gospel. But if you've articulated the good news to them and you've taken them to the place where uh, they should hear, now you don't give up on them, of course. Don't ever give up praying for them. But it could be time for you to just pull back now and just pray and allow God to be at work in the way that he will be at work. So pray for wisdom to stop talking as well. Be bold, proclaim, but direct your attention towards where people are faithful and that's my final point is that after doing what we are called to do entrust people to God through prayer 
That's how God is at work. He, he is at work through our proclamation, but he is at work in our prayers that he calls us to. And uh, in the Old Testament, in some places, I, there's passages that, that talk about us weeping over the lost. I just want to ask you, when was the last time you wept over the lost? Where you were overcome with the reality that there's people around you that are going to hell. And if you do that, if you, if you really consider that and just shake this modern Christian rubbish where we just kind of go and enjoy a service and we actually live out the Great Commission in our lives, we're going to weep over the lost that they will come to Christ. That's what God desires from us. He desires that kind of labor from us in prayer. Next week, we look at the reality of you don't have because you don't ask. And so uh, I encourage you that you preach the gospel and then you pray. So maybe you have told somebody and you've seen no fruit and no response. But remember, this important reality is that God's word never returns void. If your gospel has been preached by you, then it's done its work and it will do its work. If you have spoken and it was never for nothing. There is never a time where we will walk away and go, oh, that was a real waste of my time telling people about what Jesus did. It's never a waste of time. It's the living word of God that transforms sinners. And so it always produces and, and brings to pass what it sets out to do. So we are the workers of the field, the harvest. We are planting seeds and uh, we are doing as God has asked. Trust in God with what he has given you to do. And that might be in some places, uh, now moving on and checking in with somebody from time to time, bringing up the discussion yet another day, but commit them to prayer. Pray and seek for the people of peace in your life, those who have ears to hear and will receive and want to know more. And if you begin this week with prayer about this, God will bring people across your path that you get to minister to. If you start tomorrow as you're driving to work, Lord, give me an opportunity to talk about you to somebody today. You will have opportunities. God offer, operates like this. Lord, who can I disciple in the church and who can I help? Our God answers prayers. So may your hearts be stirred. May we be encouraged towards the lost. May we be bold to speak, but at the same time have the wisdom to hold back where there is nothing but rejection of the gospel also. Let's pray together.